Last week, we took a, a break from the series of messages that I had started. We're jumping back into that this morning, uh, this series of messages on the prayers of the Apostle Paul that he prayed for the various churches that he influenced. And the idea here is that we would take these prayers that we're going to do, look at this morning, and that we wouldn't just kind of keep them in the classroom of learning, but that we would take these prayers and put them into the laboratory of our prayer life and pray for these things specifically. Now imagine, you know, it's, it's sort of like two people, one person praying is amazing. Two people praying is incredible. I mean, how much if 100 people or more are praying the exact same thing? And I'll say it again, it's not the length of your prayer, it is the strength of your prayer. And there is great strength when we come together again. So uh, let's read the text, Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. We'll uh, jump into the prayers then and look for, at prayers for our community and beyond. Paul writes these words, finally, brothers, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one, and we have confidence in the Lord about you. That you, are doing, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. So from this text, what we're going to get this morning are three prayers pulled out of it for us to pray this week. And I, I've been excited because this is only like the second week of this series, but every week we've had guests who would not call Walkersville Community Church their home church. And I'm really excited because I get to say, uh, those of you that call this church your home, please pray these prayers for your church this week. But then those who are guests, please take these and pray for your church. Because if I know anything about your church without knowing anything about your church, is that your church needs prayer and that your pastor needs prayer. So... That's one of the greatest things that you can do for your pastor. So look at this. First prayer for this week is pray for the nations this week. Pray for the nations this week. Now you say, well, wait a minute. I thought we were going to be praying all these prayers that we were, go that we were praying. I thought we were praying them for us. And, and we're going to pray for the nations this week because Paul does something um, a little bit uncharacteristic. There are many times where he would pray for the church, but then there were times where he would ask the church to pray for him. And in verse 1, looking at the text again, finally, brothers, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as has happened among you. Now, I want to catch you up to speed if you weren't here a couple weeks ago. We saw that the Apostle Paul prayed specific prayers for the specific churches that were in specific contexts and time dealing with their own challenges, and he didn't pray for other, the church the same way. He didn't pray for the church in Thessalonica like he did Ephesus. Uh, so, so it wasn't just like Paul said, hey, church, I'm going to pray for you. God bless you. Amen. He prayed specifically for them, but here we have where he turns it and says, pray for pray for us. Uh, secondly, we saw that he viewed the church, and we should view the church, not simply as a collection of individuals, but as a whole. And the way that I, I, I said this to kind of get us thinking in this direction is that just as we can say these words that God loves you or God loves me, that we can also say God loves us. That just as God sees us as individual people, he sees us also as a community of people who are coming together to follow Jesus and learn what that's like and not do it perfectly, but get up and try better the next time. And, and the final thing that I hope we got from the message was that, that we need to be in a relationship with both Christ and his church. 
The latest statistics that I saw said that only one out of three who claim to be in relationship with Christ are in regular worship. Now, I'm preaching to the choir this morning because you're here. But, but I've been challenged by something that I shared with our men's group uh, earlier this week. And it just kind of struck me. The, we often, when we're talking about salvation, will use the words personal Savior. And what I'm about to say is, is not a saying that says, let's get rid of that, let's never say that again, because I think it has value. But I looked in the scriptures, and not only is the term personal Savior absent, but even the word personal, personal, is absent from the scriptures. And I say that to share with you, let's not throw that away, but let's remember that Jesus has a personal relationship with us, but he calls us to be part of his body. Jesus is not a headless horseman where there's the head over here and then a bunch of people separated. We are the church. We are the church. So back to the text here, the apostle breaks away for praying for the church and requests prayers from the church. And I want you to look at the prayer again in verse 1 again, and we've got a springboard prayer to pray for this week. Uh, what a prayer to pray, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead, may speed ahead and be honored. Now, the verse that we're going to be praying from this week is Acts 17, 11, and I have it on your outline sheet. And there's part of this that I highlighted, because in this text, Paul is comparing uh, the church at Thessalonica or, or the people in Thessalonica some of which readily accepted, as he states in the text, Um, but then there were those that did not accept. And after that, he went to a place called Berea, and he makes this contrast between the the, the people in Thessalonica and those in Berea when he says these words, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Here's the bolded part. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. As we pray for the nations this week, this is our prayer, that the word of God would not just touch the nations or reach the nations, but that the word would go forth speedily and that people's hearts would be such that they examine the scriptures and have a hunger for God in his word. And I've asked Lisa Ford this morning if she will pray a prayer along like that. Father God, we're so thankful for your word. We're thankful to be blessed to be able to have your word open at our fingertips anytime we want it. Father, there's so many across this land, across the nations that don't have access to your word. But Father, there are many out there spreading the gospel, working hard in difficult situations to bring your word to the nations. Father, open their hearts and their minds, those who are hearing, give strength to those who are preaching your gospel. We pray that they would receive it with eagerness and get to know Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Father, those of us in this country, we ask that you would flame our desire to learn more about you and to know you. We just pray for the nations, Father. Yes, Lord. We pray for this whole land. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come. Just come and bless us. Turn our hearts back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lisa. Second prayer for this week is pray for the persecuted this week. And really, this is kind of like part B of the first prayer, because the gospel is going forth to the nations. The gospel is more successful today in the nations of the world than ever before. And yet, it is not something that comes without cost, sometimes great cost. 
so we're praying for the persecuted. Note what Paul says, because this is what he dealt with, that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. In another letter to a different church, Paul summarizes his persecution, physical persecution, emotional, spiritual hardships. And I want to read this, and I pray that as I read this, that somehow that we would, you know how, have you ever said to someone, sometimes we say this saying in jest, but then there might be other times where we may say it in earnest, where we say, I feel your pain. I feel your pain. I pray that we would get a little sense of that this morning. He writes, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Now, let's just stop right there for a moment. 40 lashes minus one, 39 lashes, and that he received these not just once, but five times. Five times he stood for his faith in Christ while they took a whip, a leather whip, and whipped his chest 13 times, then his left shoulder 13 times, and then his right shoulder 13 times. And he did it again and again and again. He says, three times I was beaten with rods, Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys, and then he begins to use a key word here, it's the word danger, the the word danger. It only appears in the New Testament nine times, eight of nine times are right here in this text where he talks about dangers, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from the other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all of the churches." Now, you've heard me say this so many times, and you probably have a pretty good feeling that I'm not going to stop saying it, but it would be one thing if we could look at this and read Paul's letter and say, wow, what a historical situation took place. But the things that Paul describes and even other things are happening every single day in our world where people are paying the price for the Word of God to go forth speedily. Open Doors is an organization that they have what they call the World Watch List, and they they update it every single year. And and this is just one of a couple organizations that I'm aware of that they do such an excellent job. They put the pulse on where the church is today in the world. And here are some of the stats. Uh, 5,000 So this would be for 22, because it's a 23 watch list. 5,621 Christians were killed for their faith last year, up 80% than just five years ago. Today, more than 360 million Christians suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination for their faith, up 20 million in just two years. Worldwide, one in, in seven, one in seven Christians are persecuted up from one in eight just two years ago. And, but here's the greatest stat. This is the unbelievable stat. This is a Holy Spirit stat. That despite the darkness and difficulty of persecution, God's church is advancing and his kingdom is growing. But that doesn't mean that, we, that we're spectators in that. It means that we are participators by praying for our brothers and sisters, the persecuted. And I've asked Keith Trimble if he would pray this verse for the persecuted this week. Father, we just ask that you uh, 
as we read through this, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Father, we just pray for the persecuted church, for the persecuted people around the world, Father, that you would just give them the strength that they need to uh, overcome and to have that knowledge that we have overcome through you, that you give us the strength, you give us the courage, you give us the power to overcome and to over, uh, overcome what the wicked one tries to do, Father. Be with us, Father, and guide us and help us in your Son's name. Amen. Amen. You know, as Keith was, was praying, first, thank you, Keith. Um, it, it struck me that, that Paul is now praying to be delivered uh, from wicked and evil men. And the Apostle Paul would be the first to raise his hand and say, that's what I was one time. I was a persecutor of the church. And I want to get in the habit, I don't do this well, but I want to get in the habit that I do not pray for the persecuted without praying for the persecutors of the faith, to pray for Saul's to become Paul's, for persecutors to become the church's greatest promoters. And then finally, our third prayer this morning is pray for right priorities. And I love, it's almost like in this verse 5, he just really gets down to brass tacks. He says, may the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God, and to the steadfastness of Christ. Now, there is a little gem in this text that I almost missed. And the little gem is this. The ESV translates this, and some other modern translations use the word to. May the Lord direct your hearts to the word of God. And that's an accurate translation. But there are other translations that that change it And it's nuanced a little bit differently because the same Greek word can mean to or into. May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. And I I think the King James, NIV, and uh, New Living Translation, others translate that into. And I'll tell you why that nuance is important because if I say to you, um, it's a hot day today, so I'm going to the pool. That may or may not mean that I'm getting wet today, right? If I go to the pool, I can sit out and tan, which I don't do. (laughs) I I can stay by the the pool and read a book, as I'm more likely to do. But like by me saying to you, I went to the pool, you you would could not bet your life that I got in the water. But think about how it's different if I say to you, I went into the pool. Big difference, right? You know that I got wet, right? And it's like, it's almost like I just tease the the water imagery more. It's almost like he's saying, may you be baptized into the love of God, into the steadfastness of Christ. And and when I read this this week, I noticed this request is brilliant because I want you to see how he first deals with our inner self by praying for the love of God, and then he deals with our outer self and to the steadfastness of Christ. In other words, before dealing with our outward behavior, he deals with our inward heart. In other words, I say there's an inside job here and an outside job. The inside job is may the Lord direct your hearts to or into the love of God. Now, let me tell you why that's important, because every one of us, I believe, has been in a place in life where we've had a problem, an outward problem. How many of you, how many of us, all of us, have have tried to change something on the outside without getting to the heart. Change the outward behavior instead of touching the heart. There's a story um, that is told of a test that was given to patients 
in insane asylums of years past. And I seriously doubt it's true, but it does illustrate the point. And it said, the story goes that, that to, to test whether a patient was ready to be released, they would fill up a bathtub with water. And then they would give that patient a teaspoon, a teacup, and a bucket. And the patient was told, drain the tub. As you can imagine, some few patients reach for the teaspoon, more reach for the teacup, and even more for the bucket. But it was those who bypassed all of these and pulled the plug to let the tub drain that were released. I know some of you are thinking, that's not what I would have done. <laughs> but let's get a room by the window. In other words, these patients went to the heart of the matter. And as I, as I read that, I thought, you know, how many times in my life has, has there been something outward I wanted to change? An area of holiness, an area of walking with God, uh, an area that, that if I do this, this, will, this will, will be better for me to walk in the life that Jesus has for me <clears throat> and, and, and attack that thing with a teaspoon or a teacup, not getting to the heart of it. He gets to the heart of it that you would be your hearts directed into the love of God. And then the outside job, and to the steadfastness of Christ. In other words, we can try all that we want to be steadfast, to do the right things, but what we really need first is a touch of the heart. So we're going to pray for right priorities this week and that God would direct our hearts into the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. And that's our verse for today. And Jesse Case is going to pray that prayer. As Paul says, may the Lord direct your heart to the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Lord, I pray that no matter what is taking place in our lives, that our hearts are captivated by your steadfast love more in each and every day that we are desperate for your offering while we deny the self and sin. I pray that when we compare the wages of love against the alternative that we see life as truth and death is to be displaced from our lives, we welcome your love to our innermost being and pray that we grow in it always, pouring it out upon our neighbors while we being anointed in the same. I ask that you saturate this church in your love. I pray this not only for this church, but for the community, the nation, and all the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesse. Well, I feel like I have laid my cards on the table. And what I mean by that is the purpose of this series is that we would pray. No hidden motives, no hidden thing. that we would pray as a church for these things that we looked at today. And we welcome you. We have a 9 o'clock prayer meeting from 9 to 9.30 on Sunday morning. So it just means getting here a little bit early and praying. Uh, we also have a Wednesday night prayer that will be right out after the, well, actually during the food trucks at seven. And we come together, and for the first half hour, we're just kind of spread all over the church, and you, you are just praying yourself in silence or what, however, journaling. And then we come together and pray corporately. We welcome you to that, but, but even more so that we would, we would all pray. And I want to just... Um, end with these words. Uh, these are words from an older pastor who has uh, since gone on to be with the Lord. And I had the privilege back in the 90s to be in meetings with him uh, as clergy would gather. And he was a prayer warrior. And whenever someone would be asked to pray, um, so like if I was praying he would say, pray, 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 pray. And in my heart, I'm like, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> but he said this, little prayer, little power. Some prayer, some power. Much prayer, much power. And that, my friends, is what we are all hungering for. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for these prayer requests for this week, and I pray, God, 
that with one heart and one mind, even as the scriptures tell us that the early church was in one accord, in agreement, praying, um, Father, that, that we would do so. Uh, I pray, Lord, that we would be people who pray for our church because we want to see you lifted high. We want to see Jesus um, move among our community as, as we go out in outreach. And we thank you, God, that, that even this VBS that we had was preceded by probably more prayer than ever before, and we saw the results of that. We thank you, God. Remind us to pray in Jesus' name. Amen.